There will be a review on February 8th in the evening. Ashley will be sending out information about when and where exactly. Okay, so look for that in your email. <clears throat> also, a number of people have asked me how much of all this that I tell you you need to know. So what we will do is give you a set of questions to study before the exam next time, sometime next week. And the information in those questions will be what, what's on the exam, okay? We tell you a lot more than we will ask you just so to illustrate different principles and give you an idea about all of virology. But in what we want you to know for the exam, we will let you know. Okay? So today we're going to talk about structure of viruses, how to build a virus. There are very definitive concepts on how this happens, and we're going to go over those today. So this will apply to all the viruses we will be discussing in this course. Now, the viruses are, of course, made up of different components. A major one is our proteins, and these proteins have very specific functions. No matter what the virus looks like, we have, we have diverse looking viruses, as you know already, but those proteins that comprise the genome have a number of functions. They have to make a protective shell for the genome. Remember, the genome is the important part. It is what's going to transfer the genetic information from one cell to another. It has to be protected, and that's the role of the shell. The viral proteins, the structural proteins, also have to recognize the genome so it can be incorporated into the shell. And then for those viruses that have a lipid envelope around them, we've already mentioned some of those briefly, those, uh, the proteins have to be able to interact with the host cell in order to form that envelope. All right, so that's one part of the function. Another is that these proteins of the virus particles have to be able to deliver the genome into the host cell. So they have to protect it, carry it from one cell to another, and then deliver it into the host cell. So they have to bind receptors. They have to participate in encoding, and we'll talk about those next time, those steps. Fusion with cell membranes. And then when a genome gets into a cell, it has to go to the right place. And that's different depending on what kind of virus, either the cytoplasm or the nucleus and so forth. Uh, they also, these virus proteins, structural proteins, also do many other things. Uh, during replication, you will see they interact with cell proteins so that replication is more efficient. Uh, they help transport the genome and other components to different parts of the cell. And then, of course, there are many, many interactions of these structural proteins with the immune system. And that's the whole basis of being protected against the virus infection and so forth that we'll consider in the second half of this course. Now, one thing you, you should understand at the start is that a virion, that infectious particle, is not just an inert particle. It's not like a latex bead that gets passively taken into cells. Uh, these are little machines, actually. We say that they are metastable. That is, they haven't reached a free energy, minimum free energy conformation. And this is a graph of what I'm talking about. These are a couple of different energy states that a virus can uh, be present at. Here is energy on the y-axis, and, and x is just a random uh, time. It could be time. It could be something else. Uh, virions exist in this conformation. This is the minimum free energy. That's when they're energetically favorable. But they, to get there, they have to go over a barrier. And this usually requires them to undergo conformational changes during entry. All right, so they have to overcome this barrier, and then only then will they uncoat and deliver their genome. And you'll see exactly how this occurs next time. But for now, just remember that they are machines and they play an active role in delivery. They're not passive at all. So in other words, for a virus to be infectious, here's another way of looking at metastability. It has to be metastable. You have to protect the genome. You have to have a stable virus particle that travels from person to person, for example, in the air or on objects. But at some point, it has to come apart. And that's what we mean by metastable. Going from that, that stable to uncoated position is, is a property of metastability. So a, a virion is really a machine. And as you will see, it has moving parts. And it does do work. We often say that viruses are spring-loaded. This is another way of saying that when they are assembled, 
they are loaded in a specific confirmation, and then a trigger has to trigger the spring, basically, so that the genome can come out. When we assemble the particles, we use energy, and that energy is released upon encoding. And how this happens will, will be very clear in the next lecture. There are many different mechanisms. So when we talk about virus particles, we're really talking about two distinct things. We're talking about structure and function. It's just like a house if you were an architect. Uh, the structure of the particle is created by taking a small number of proteins and repeating them many times. And they have identical or co close to identical interactions between them. And then there is the function part, which is that they have to deliver the genome. So this really nice assembly that's made by all these different contacts has to come apart. So the interactions that make up a virus particle are non-covalent. You can't make a virus with covalent bonds linking all the assemblies together because it would never come apart. So those are very interesting and unusual properties. You have to have a really stable particle, but it has to be non-covalent so it can come apart to release the genome. Now before we move on today, some definitions that to, you should know so that you'll know what we're talking about. I'll often talk about a subunit, a structural subunit. This refers to a single polypeptide. So in the, in the context of this virion at the upper right here, here are the individual polypeptide chains here. For this virus, they're called VP1, VP2, and VP3. Okay, so that's what we mean by subunit. Uh, the structural unit is the unit from which the capsids or the nucleocapsids are built. Uh, and that is shown here. If you take uh, these three subunits, you make a structural unit shown here, blue, red, and yellow. So that's a structural unit. Other names for them that you will see in the book, for example, are protomer or asymmetric unit. All right, so that's a, that is a subunit, a structural unit. And then finally, we have the capsid, which is the entire assembly. It's the protein shell that surrounds uh, the genome. Now, sometimes we talk about, yes? Is the um, structural unit, is that um, the unit of one red, one yellow, and one blue? Or is it the um, four blues, four reds, and four yellows in that sort of color? It's, it is the structural unit is one blue, one red, and one yellow. So these are actually found in infected cells, discrete entities that then assemble to form larger structures. Nucleocapsid uh, is a protein nucleic, assemb nucleic acid assembly within the virion. Now, this is a little tricky because sometimes the nucleocapsid is the virus, and sometimes it's a subassembly of a virus. So, for, um, so we have some viruses that have a capsid such as this, which has nucleic acid in it, but then it's surrounded by an envelope, a lipid envelope. In that case, this would be the nucleocapsid because it's the structure that the, that the nucleic acid is in contact with. But in this conformation, without an envelope, it would just be a capsid. Now, envelope viruses have in the, inside of them nucleocapsids as well, that is, complexes of nucleic acid and protein. You'll see a, a bit more of this later. Then we have envelopes, which are the viral membranes. These are host-derived lipid bilayers, which are shown in these diagrams. And finally, the virion, as you know, is the infectious virus particle. All right, just some more reminder to you about size. We'll be throwing around a lot of numbers here. I will interchangeably use nanometers and angstroms. This slide is in nanometers, which is 10 to the minus 9th meters, of course. An alpha helix in a protein is about a nanometer in diameter. DNA is about 2 nanometers in diameter. Here's a ribosome, 20 nanometers, and poliovirus. 30 nanometers. So remember, polio is similar in size to a ribosome. And then, of course, the Mimi viruses are way off the charts at 750 nanometers. And here's another picture to give you an idea of size. Here's a virus particle. Uh, this happens to be rhinovirus, very similar in size to polio. And a bunch of other cell proteins of various sorts. Uh, glutamine synthetase, for example, is a rather large enzyme approaching the size of poliovirus. Um, chaperonin, grow EL down here. You can see some very large proteins in the cell. Here's our ribosome again. And then there are very, very small proteins as well. So poliovirus are within the size range of many cellular proteins. <clears throat>
So the first time a virus was reconstituted in vitro, that is outside of a cell, uh, was this experiment in 1955. Uh, with our old friend tobacco mosaic virus, remember the first virus that was discovered. Um, what was done here was they took these virus particles, which are shown in this electron micrograph, and they dissociated the RNA from the protein and made purified RNA and purified protein. And then they mixed them back together. They formed spontaneously, they formed virus particles, which were then infectious. They could put that on plant leaves and it would initiate infection. So that is important for two reasons today. One is that the assembly is a, is a self-encoded process. All the information is in the protein and the RNA. And it also is, was the first demonstration that RNA could serve as genetic material. We had already learned that DNA could be viral genetic material. This is the first time that RNA sh was shown to have that property. Now, uh, for people who study virus structures, there are three or four very important tools which we'll touch on just briefly, just so you understand how we get these interesting structures. It's electron microscopy, x-ray crystallography, cryo-electron microscopy, and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. The first electron micrographs of viruses were done in 1940 by Helmuth Ruska. He took pictures of bacteriophages. Here on the right is one of his early pictures. These are bacteriophages attached to a bacterium. If you speak German, you can go find the original article and, and read it. Now, as electron microscopy developed, it became more refined and able to reveal more and more. A key component of looking at viruses in the electron microscope is you need to have a dye because biological materials are, have inherently low contrast. So it was found that you could stain virus particles with um, electron dense material. So you effectively negatively stain. You stain the surrounding area and the virus itself transmits uh, electrons through the grit. This has a very low resolution, 50 to 75 angstroms. Remember, so now I'm working in angstroms. Uh, an, an alpha helix is about 10 angstroms in diameter. An angstrom, of course, is 0.1 nanometer. And so you really don't know any details from the EM, but you can get a good sense of what. Uh, virus particles look like. So when you, when you do these electron micrographs, you put the virus preparations on a grid, which is eventually going to go into the electron microscope, and then you stain it with your negative stain. Uh, and you can do this in two ways. If you stain the whole particle, so here's a virus particle sitting on a grid and the dark material is the stain. If you cover the particle and then bombard it with x-rays, you will get an image, which is shown on the right here and also below of both the top and the bottom of the virus particle. And what you're seeing is an outline of the virus. Remember, the electrons are passing through. And wherever the dye has been uh, adhering to, um, you get a, a black image. This is not structurally correct, because it's both the top and the bottom mixed together. So what you like to do is only stain about half the particle. So you're only looking, in this case, at the bottom. And that's when you get really structurally relevant information like this on the right. You can see the difference between these two uh, images. The one on the left is a mix of the top and the bottom. You really can't tell fine structure. But here you can see they're very interesting subunits uh, on that particle. So here are some uh, images of various virus particles stained by negative staining and photographs taken in the electron micrograph. We have a herpes virus here, papilloma viruses. So herpes has an envelope around it, as you can see. These are, these are naked icosahedral viruses, as you'll see in a moment, enteroviruses, uh, hepatitis B virus. This is a paramyxovirus, a rotavirus, and our famous uh, adenovirus that looks like the satellite, influenza virus, and a pox virus. So really beautiful pictures you can get. And you can distinguish many of these morphologically. The other technique. I want to tell you just about briefly about is cryo-electron microscopy because in the course of what I tell you in this course, we'll be using a lot of cryo-EM data. This is basically a technique where you don't, you don't stain the virus particles. You just freeze them to give them a little bit of contrast. The freezing introduces contrast. So if you take a picture of frozen virions by EM, this is what it looks like. And the idea here is that on that grid, every particle is in a slightly different orientation. 
So what you do is you, you photograph a few hundred particles and then you digitize all of them and then transform them mathematically by Fourier transformations and make a reconstruction of the three-dimensional shape based on all these individual orientations. Sort of like a CAT scan where the X-ray goes around you to collect three-dimensional data and then the images are each assembled into a three-dimensional image. So that's what's done here. It's called a 3D reconstruction. And this can give you very, very nice uh, images of virions. And in fact, in recent years, really based on the computing improvements that have been used, the algorithms, it's possible to get down to a 3.3 angstrom resolution, which is very good. And finally, uh, this is an example of a cryo-EM image with, of poliovirus in red with uh, its receptor bound to the particle. So you see both the virus particle uh, and the receptor. And finally, uh, the highest resolution uh, is, X -ray, is obtained by X-ray crystallography, two to three angstroms resolution for viruses. Uh, this depends on being able to make crystals of your virus. You have to use highly purified virus preparations and you hope that it crystallizes, which is always a bit of black magic in itself. And then you take these crystals and bombard them with an X-ray beam. You move the crystals as the X-ray beam goes through it and the X-ray basically bounces off the atoms in the crystals and you collect the reflections of all those X-rays bouncing off. And as you move it around, you take individual photographs and in a process very much like the 3D reconstruction for cryo-EM, you eventually derive a structure by looking at all these two-dimensional uh, plates or photographs of how the electrons are bouncing off the uh, atoms. This has very high resolution, and with this you can see individual polypeptide change as well as the side chains uh, on those. So crystallography uh, was made possible for viruses in 1935. Again, tobacco mosaic virus was the first virus to be crystallized. Uh, at that time, we couldn't solve structures of such big assemblies. The, the computing power needed to do that didn't come about until the 1970s. So we had crystals. We could have collected data, but we would never have been able to make a virus structure. The first structure, X-ray crystallography structure of a virus, was in 1978 by Steve Harrison and colleagues at Harvard, a plant virus, tomato bushy stunt virus, TBSV. And you can, see, you can see very interesting images of the surface of these viruses and uh, start to think about the biological relevance of them. The first animal viruses whose structure were solved was in 1985, poliovirus. And that's shown here. This is actually two different resolutions, X-ray on the left, about two angstroms, and cryo-electron microscopy on the right, about 10 angstroms. So you can see the, the very big difference in resolution. Um, here you can see individual polypeptide chains and the side chains. And on the right you can't, but you can see surface features. Now let's talk about how you build viruses from uh, individual components. Uh, our understanding of this started with Watson and Crick, and you remember them because they, of course, discovered the structure of DNA, but they did one other thing that's really important. They gave us a lot of our understanding on, on virus architecture. In 1956, they said, they published a paper saying, most of the virus particles you look at are either spherical or rod-shaped. This is just looking at them in the EM. And they also knew that most viruses were made with just a few proteins, different proteins. There weren't a lot of different proteins that made up the virus, but they were always repeated many times. The idea being that viral genomes are pretty small, so you can't encode a lot of proteins to make a structure. So they said this must mean that there must be uh, regular and repeated interactions among all these proteins that make up the virus. So you have just a few proteins, you have to repeat the interactions over and over again. So what they said in the end was that you take virions with few identical proteins and you repeat them over and over, either in helical symmetry for viruses that are rod-shaped or in, uh, pl with platonic symmetry for round viruses. All right, so they went from the idea of repetition of subunits, genetic economy, to explaining the two different kinds of virus structures, round viruses and rod-shaped structures, uh, by this repeating strategy. So we'll, I'll show you what that means in a moment. So these are what we call symmetry rules. These are rules for assembling virus particles 
from just a few components. And there are two really important rules here. One, each subunit interacts with its neighbors identically. So you take one protein subunit, you repeat it many times, it's going to be interacting with all of its neighbors in identical ways. So this gives you a symmetrical arrangement. That's where the symmetry of virus particles originates from. And second, the interaction between these subunits. So you have protein subunits repeated many times. They're interacting with each other in a virion in similar ways. Those interactions are non-covalent, OK? It, because you have to be able to uncoat the virus, get the nucleic acid out. And having a non-covalent bond, they said, is also useful because if you make a mistake in assembly, you can easily reverse it. So you have, you, you have ever-free assembly. So regular structures form when identical bonds are made between identical subunits. So that's what virus particles are. These are regular structures made from similar or identical subunits repeated many times, and the interactions between those subunits are similar. And this is in contrast to clumps. So if you work with proteins, you know, you, you can often get clumps or aggregates of proteins. That's because you're getting non-identical bonds b forming between uh, otherwise similar proteins. So it's the difference between getting a virus particle uh, and an aggregate. And this is important for making vaccines, this whole idea of repetition of interactions among a limited number of proteins. It allows us to express, say, one protein in some cell of, of some type and get virus-like particles assembled. So we currently have two vaccines that we use, the hepatitis B virus vaccine and uh, the hep human papillomavirus vaccine. These are made by taking one protein of each virus and expressing it. In this case, they're expressed in yeast or other systems, and they self-assemble into virus-like particles which are shown here in the electron microscope. One protein, you express it, it makes particles. These are empty, of course. There's no genome in them. And these are what you are used as a vaccine for HBV and HPV. And again, this is because you have one protein with, with the information in it to interact with like proteins and form a symmetrical structure. And that symmetrical structure, of course, is the virus particle. Yes? Okay, so the question is, if, if, the pro if the viral proteins can form empty capsids, why don't you just get empty capsids uh, in infection as soon as the proteins are made? So there are several answers. One is that some, in some infections you do see empty capsids, but these are reversible. So at, at some point that they can be disassembled and the genome can be put into them. Uh, other virus regulate the synthesis of structural proteins so they occur later in the infectious cycle when the genomes are made. So early on, you don't have capsids being made, OK? Now, we got a great email last year from a listener of, of my podcast. So I want to share this with you. This is not a virologist. This is just somebody who likes viruses. And he said, although they, although they aren't viruses, could you please explain how virus-like particles are created and used in vaccines like Gardasil and Cervarix, and that are being developed for flu vaccines as well? It seems somehow magical that you can build something that is structurally a virus on the outside, but is essentially an empty shell. And VLPs may be better than inactivated vaccines because you get all of the outside of the virus rather than perhaps just the broken parts. So some vaccines are broken up virions or selected parts, a subunit vaccine. So that's the magic because you have a single capsid protein that can make symmetrical interactions with all of its neighbors and spontaneously form these shells. Now, let's take a look at, at the first of those two kinds of symmetry that um, Watson and Crick thought up, helical symmetry. This is very simple. Here, what you do is you take a, a, a protein subunit. So let's take tobacco mosaic virus first. This is the coat protein subunits, these brownish proteins. And these are all coating the viral RNA. So these protein subunits interact with the viral genome. That's the green uh, tube here. Uh, 
And they're also interacting with each other in identical manners. And this is the virion. That's how the virion is formed. It forms a helix of protein linked to RNA. That's why we call them helical symmetry. So for tobacco mosaic virus, that is the virion. Here it is down here in an electron microscope. And there's no other component of the virion. But many animal viruses have this kind of helical symmetry. Again, a single uh, coat protein interacting with other coat proteins as well as the viral RNA. Here's an example for Sendai virus, a virus related to measles virus. And this is vesicular stomatitis virus related to rabies virus. So it's the same concept, except these viruses are always with an envelope, a membrane around them. Here's an electron micrograph of measles. And this uh, virion is broken, so you can see the nucleocapsid spilling out. So this is an example of a nucleocapsid. This is protein RNA. It's within an envelope, so we call it a nucleocapsid. Here, we just call it a capsid because it is the virion. You could, if you called it a nucleocapsid, you wouldn't be wrong, but technically it's just a capsid. All right, so that's helical symmetry. Uh, it's very simple. Coat protein molecules in identical equivalent interactions with each other. Now, you can build one of these if you, if you have ever seen these little magnetic balls called buckyballs. Uh, for some reason, in the last year or so, these have become very popular. You can build a helical capsid. And I'm going to show you one right here. So this, these are, you can wrap these up in such a way that they will interact with each other. There's no RNA here, of course, so this is just a protein subunit. But they, they spontaneously form a helix. It's amazing. And, um, of course, the only thing missing from this is the RNA genome. But this is exactly what helical symmetry is. And each of these subunits is interacting with each other in identical manners. That's the whole purpose. And if you express this in a cell, it would self-assemble. Right. I think we have a movie of this. Just for those who are going to look at this um, later, they will get to see that. It's the same idea. You can wrap and unwrap these uh, capsids. So that's an example of a helical capsid. Here's vesicular stomatitis virus again. It's an envelope virus. This is a representation of this helical structure inside of it. It's not really, it's not really an accurate representation. It's just a schematic because it should be coiled up just like this. And this is formed, again, by an RNA linked to repeated capsid subunits. So here, for the, in the case of vesicular stomatitis virus, here is one of the capsid subunits. So it's one of these magnetic beads, right? That is this protein right down here. And it interacts with about nine nucleotides of viral RNA. And it repeats. So if you have a long RNA, you just have one after another of these protein subunits linked. Here's a, here's a circle of 10 of these. And you can see the protein binds the RNA. Then there's a little bit of RNA in between each one. So that's helical symmetry, very simple to assemble that. Just think of the magnetic beads. Uh, so there are a number of viruses uh, that have genomes with, that are helical in symmetry, and they have enveloped. There don't seem to be any animal viruses with just the nucleocapsid, like TMV. They always have an envelope. Paramyxoviruses, that's measles virus, uh, rabies virus, influenza virus, Ebola virus as well. And again, these are always called nucleocapsids when they're within an envelope, the nucleic acid protein assembly packaged within the virion. So that usually we say the nucleocapsid is not the virion. So if this were tobacco mosaic virus, I would call it a capsid because it's the virion. Now, so that's a, that's helical symmetry. This is how you make rod-shaped viruses, all right? T tobacco mosaic virus, uh, rhabdoviruses, and so forth. Um, how do you make a spherical virus? Remember Watson and Crick said viruses come in two forms, rod-like and spherical. So how do you do spherical? And more, more to the point, these proteins are pretty irregular. Um, in fact, that magnetic assembly is wrong because each protein is spherical, and that's not the way they happen. The proteins are very irregular in shape. So how do you make a round virus from proteins that aren't round, basically? And here are two clues that were used to get at the answer. First, all round capsid have a very specific number of proteins that comprise them. Uh, here are multiples of 60. And secondly, uh, 
you, spherical viruses can be tiny or quite large, but the capsid proteins that make them up are always, are always usually pretty small, 20 to 60 kilodaltons on average. So there's something going on here because you don't make a big virus just with bigger proteins. Somehow you take small proteins and make bigger viruses from it. Now the answer came from two investigators in 1962 who knew of Watson and Crick's work. And they also knew that, remember I said that round, according to Watson and Crick, the round viruses were assembled in symmetry that resembled platonic solids. And it turned out that the only symmetry that was used was that of an icosahedron. So they took that information, the round viruses are icosahedrons. Uh, they also found that by studying viruses that capsid subunits in the virus particles tended to be arranged in groups of five and six, pentamers and hexamers. And finally, um, the number of capsids fell into certain values of what we call T numbers. I'll show you what a T number is in a moment, and it'll make sense to you. So this is an icosahedron. It's, of course, a geometric shape. It has 20 faces, and each of these triangular aspects is a face, um, and each of them is an equilateral triangle. And this an icosahedron is how you make a closed shell with the fewest number of identical subunits of all the platonic solids. So you have 60 identical subunits can make up an icosahedron. <clears throat> and then when you do this, you have one sub, you can have in theory one protein, one identical protein repeated 60 times to make these. You end up what, with what we call axes of symmetry. And all that means is that there are certain numbers of copies of the protein around each axis. So a five-fold axis of symmetry there are simply five copies of the five subunit proteins around it. Uh, so each of these uh, equilateral triangles would be a subunit. You can see there are five around that. The three-fold axis, you have three copies around it. And then each two-fold axis is surrounded by two. Yes? You mentioned the identical subunits, but the picture you showed before with the um, multicolored subunits implied that they weren't identical. Right. So, this, as you will see as we proceed, there are variations on this identical scheme. So to make bigger viruses, they can't be identical. They have, they're, they're similar, uh, but not quite identical. So that picture uh, was illustrating the chemical differences between the proteins. All right, so the icosahedron is how you arrange the protein subunits to, to make these round viruses. So let's start with a small ground virus. Here's the simplest icosahedral capsid you can make. 60 copies of the same protein. You put them into an icosahedral uh, symmetry and you can make a virion out of it. And it's shown here. Each of these little commas is a protein subunit. Again, they're all the same protein. And here you have your five-fold axis of symmetry, uh, two-fold and three-fold. And you can see there are five one, two, three, four, five copies of the protein around the five-fold axis. That's all that means. And in this case, the protein is the structural unit. The protein is the same as the structural unit. And finally, all the interactions of these proteins among each other is identical. Every place you go on this capsid, every protein is, a, is interacting with its neighbor in an absolutely identical manner. So this is the most perfect example of this symmetry. A cap, simple a capsids uh, made up of one protein repeated 60 times. And here's an example of that, adeno-associated virus. It's a parvovirus. Again, a ubiquitous virus infects um, just about all of us. Small capsid, 25 nanometers, 60 copies of a single capsid protein. So there are a number of examples of this. But now, how do you build bigger viruses? Because remember, Mimi viruses are 750 nanometers, much, much bigger than this. You add more subunits. And how do you do that? Now we talk about the triangulation number, T. And the only thing you need to know is that is the number of facets per triangular face of an icosahedron. So here is the simplest icosahedron that we've been talking about, 60 copies of one protein repeated. The triangulation number is one because uh, each triangular face has just one facet. Uh, 
Here's an example of a larger capsid where we have inserted additional subunits so that we can expand the capsid. And what you have effectively done is to insert more facets. Here's the triangular face. It joins the five-fold axes. And now you can see you have one, two, three, four facets. You know, think of a jewel with faceted surfaces. That's all this is. So we've put in additional facets to make the capsid bigger. Yes? Now, each, each triangular face, that the number of facets per face is how you define it. So this just has one. This, is not, this whole thing is not a face. Just one of these is a face. There are 12 of these per t equals 1 structure. Now, this has, putting in more subunits has consequences for the symmetry. So far, we've had perfect symmetry with the t equals 1 virus. But when you start to put in other subunits to make bigger capsids, then things change and you have to bend the rules a little bit. And now we move to sort of a gray area of what we call quasi-equivalence. So we don't have any more complete identical interactions among all the subunits. You can't because as you insert more in, you break the rules. So when you have more than 60 subunits, each one has a quasi-equivalent position. All that means is that these various proteins are interacting in the capsid in similar ways, but not identical any longer. And I'll, I'll illustrate that for you in a moment. It's very simple. So when you have T equals 1 capsids, 60 subunits, same protein, you can have all in identical interactions. But as soon as you start getting bigger, you break that rule. So here's an example of a T equals 3 capsid. And these, are all, these commas, again, are all the different protein subunits. We have, in this one, 180 protein subunits. They're, in this case, they happen to be identical proteins, but they're interacting in very different ways in the capsid. They're no longer all the same kind of environment as we had with the T equals 1 capsid. And the easiest way to look at this is to just see that now not only do we have pentamers. Here's an example at a five-fold axis, one, two, three, four, five. There are five copies of this orange subunit around the five-fold axis. But look here around this three-fold axis. We have one, two, three, four, five, six of these subunits. So that's a hexamer. This is the first time we've seen this. So far, we've seen just pentamers. Now we have pentamers and hexamers. So by definition, the, the interprotein interactions in this kind of a virus particle are not going to be the same because you have these two different environments. There are also other differences as well, but we don't need to go into that. The important point is not all the interactions are equivalent anymore, and that's what this means, this quasi-equivalence. Uh, so an example of this is an insect virus called Nodomura virus. It's a rather small virus. It's a T equals 3 triangulation, number three facets per icosahedral face, and it's 180 copies of a single capsid protein. And again, even though they're the same protein, they're in different environments on the capsid, whether they're in a pentamer or a hexamer, so you no longer have equivalent interactions. That's where the quasi-equivalence comes from. Another example is poliovirus, which actually we started out uh, this discussion with. It's made up of actually three different polypeptides, VP1, VP2, and VP3. Uh, it is arranged in the same kind of symmetry. This is the structural unit outlined here with a blue, red, and yellow cap, uh, protein subunit. This is actually called pseudo T equals 3 because each protein, VP1, 2, and 3, is chemically different. It's not the same protein. So, so far we've talked about 180 proteins in a T equals 3 particle, but it's the same protein. This is T equals 3, but it's three different proteins. So, it's pseudo T equals 3, but that's not really of great concern to you. The point is that this is another way to make a, a larger capsid. So let's get a little appreciation for what these look like. Here is again the poliovirus capsid. The surface is very irregular. It has lots of cavities and promontories, which we'll talk about later. If you slice it in half, you can see this is where the nucleic acid would be. It has a rather thin wall compared to the whole diameter of the particle. And you can see the inside is quite smooth. The RNA would be packed very tightly into here. So this is a spring-loaded capsid. We put energy when we assemble into it. And at some point, it's going to pop open, and the RNA is going to come out. Now, we can get even bigger 
viruses than the ones we've talked about. As you know, adenoviruses and mimiviruses are all much bigger. Uh, they have very different symmetries. And now, in addition to the 180 or 240 proteins that make up the capsid, you have other specialized proteins inserted into these. And here, just to show you, just as an illustration, adenoviruses, these are all the proteins that are found in the capsid. There are major structural components like the hexon, which comprises most of the capsid, but then you have a lot of other proteins that have very specific functions, uh, like binding to DNA. Uh, and the fiber protein, those Sputnik-like projections are made up of fiber proteins that radiate. So as we make bigger viruses, we have a lot of proteins associated with the capsids that are having specialized functions. So adenovirus is quite a large one. We've seen a number of pictures of these unique viruses. They have an icosahedral shell. It's a T equals 25 capsid. So there are 25 facets on each icosahedral triangle. And it's made up of all these subunits. The main protein is the hexon. But again, it has other proteins here. For example, uh, this fiber protein and the, the, the protein at the end, which interacts with the receptor, as you will see. And then there are a variety of other proteins stuck in the capsid as well that have very specialized functions. So they don't fall within our typical consideration of icosahedral symmetry. Another interesting uh, virus uh, is the real virus, which are icosahedral viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes. And I want to show you the structure of these because later when we talk about RNA synthesis, this will be important. So real viruses are nothing more than icosahedral viruses, except there are two shells, two concentric shells, one on the inside and a second wrapped around it. And these are actually structures of the two independent shells. So this is just a twist on icosahedral symmetry, but it's relevant later because when we talk about RNA synthesis, this will be important. Okay, so that is icosahedral symmetry. And just like for helical symmetry, these Icosahedral shells could be covered by an envelope. They don't have to be. There are naked icosahedral particles, and there are enveloped icosahedral particles. Among the animal viruses, all the helical particles are enveloped, as far as we know. These envelopes are derived from the host cell, because viruses can't make lipids. They don't encode the lipid synthesizing machinery, so they have to get the membranes from the host cell. And typically, these are acquired by a process called budding. Here's an example uh, of budding. The nucleocapsid of this virus is assembling just beneath the plasma membrane. And the particle begins to form by budding out. And here's the mature particle. And this can happen not just at the plasma membrane, but at a variety of other membranes in the cell. It can happen at the nuclear membrane, uh, into the ER as well. And again, these nucleocapsids that are put within the envelope, they can be icosahedral or helical symmetry. Depends on the virus. Now, when viruses do acquire envelopes, they have to have ways to let this envelope interact with the host cells that they infect next. And so they typically uh, put in those envelopes what we call viral envelope glycoproteins. These are integral membrane proteins schematized here. They have an exterior domain on the outside of the particle. They have a transmembrane domain and typically a sequence on the interior of the virion as well. And these are important for assembly of the particles, but they're also important for interacting with um, the host cell that they infect. They are receptor binding proteins, for example. So here is an, an electron micrograph of influenza virus. Uh, these are viruses with a helical nucleocapsid. It's covered with an envelope. And these viruses, of course, have glycoproteins. And in an EM, they appeared initially as these uh, rigid structures, and they were called spikes. They looked like spikes for the first people who uh, saw them, and so that name has stuck. We often call these spikes. <clears throat> these spikes, these viral glycoproteins, can be vertically oriented, like the hemagglutinin of influenza virus, or they can lie uh, parallel to the membrane of the virus. So here's the lipid membrane of a virus particle. This is, of course, derived from the host cell again. And viral glycoproteins can have a variety of conformations. These viral glycoproteins typically interact with 
structural components beneath the membrane. And these are just three different examples of that. Here, here's again, this is our virus particle. Here's the viral membrane. And here's a single viral glycoprotein. It's shown as a dimer here. And you can see it's passing through the membrane and interacting with the nucleocapsid. So this is a nucleocapsid. This happens to be an icosahedral structure. And within it is the genome of the virus. And you can see there's contacts between the glycoprotein and the capsid, the nucleocapsid. Sometimes there is another protein in between the membrane and the capsid. Here, it's, in this case, the blue spheres. These are called matrix proteins. Typically, they give some rigidity to the envelope virus particle. And these can often interact with the viral glycoproteins as well. And finally, there may be multiple layers of uh, viral proteins between the glycoprotein and the nucleocapsid. So in, in all cases, these interactions between the glycoproteins and the components beneath, they help to drive assembly and make the virus particle stable. Now, we have largely two general kinds of viruses with envelopes. One of them is called a structured envelope. Uh, and this is an example of that. This is Synbis virus. It's a toga virus member. Uh, these are viruses with plus-stranded RNA genomes. They consist of a icosahedral nucleocapsid. So inside, the genome is encased in an icosahedron, and then it's wrapped with a membrane. Now, the icosahedron, of course, has symmetry. We've just talked about the icosahedral symmetry. It has repeated axes and so forth. And amazingly, the glycoproteins on the surface of this particle adopt the symmetry of the underlying icosahedron. So here is a cryo-electron micrograph of this Synbis virus particle. And these spikes are the viral glycoproteins. And you can see within them five, three, and two-fold axes of rotational symmetry. This is not usual for uh, a viral glycoprotein because it's in sort of a fluid uh, interaction in the membrane. But these glycoproteins interact with the icosahedral capsid, and that's what gives them the symmetry. And that's what these photographs are showing you. Uh, this, is an, this is a cross-section of the virion. Here's the RNA in the middle. And here's the viral membrane, the double membrane. And each of these is the glycoproteins that are staining dark. And you can see that the glycoprotein goes through the viral membrane and is contacting the nucleocapsid directly right there. So again, that's an icosahedral nucleocapsid. And these contacts between the glycoprotein and the nucleocapsid give the glycoproteins this apparent symmetry. It's the same thing is shown here in this reconstruction. Here's the viral glycoprotein in blue. The viral membrane is in green. You can see the glycoprotein goes through the membrane and contacts the red capsid protein. So this is what are called structured envelope viruses because the glycoproteins assume the, uh, the symmetry of the underlying icosahedron. That's not true for all envelope viruses. Many of them are unstructured because they don't have icosahedral capsids underneath. They have, in these cases, uh, helical capsids. So for example, vesicular stomatitis virus uh, is an unstructured envelope. Even though these glycoproteins interact with this membrane protein below the membrane, there's no uh, icosahedral symmetry inherent in that arrangement. So the glycoproteins are randomly displayed on the surface. And influenza virus is the same thing. Let's talk about a couple of large viruses to give you a sense of how a really big structure is put together. Uh, here is an example of herpes viruses. Um, these are um, 2,000 angstrom virions, 200 nanometers. So they're, they're quite big, but they're not the biggest viruses that we know of. The viral genome encodes 80 genes. Half of these go towards building the capsid. So that's quite a lot of genetic material devoted to making a capsid. So it shows you how important it is. There are 13, among these are 13 envelope proteins. So here, these are the yellow glycoproteins in the membrane of the virus. Uh, then there's an icosahedral nucleocapsid, shown here in blue, uh, surrounding the DNA genome, made up of four different proteins. And then we have the tegument, made up of 20 different proteins. And this is important for uh, processes early in infection. In fact, last time I called this all the junk inside of these uh, virus particles. That's the tegument. 
So these are rather complex virions. If you strip away the membrane, you're left with the icosahedral capsid. And these are built using the same principles that we've talked about. You take subunits, you repeat them many times. In the case of herpes, the T number is quite large, and there are a lot of facets packed into the icosahedral face, so it's a complex capsid. But here, there is something really interesting in these capsids, and that is there is a, what is called a portal uh, at one part of the virion, on one side of the virion, and that is an opening. It's at one of the five-fold vertices, and that's uh, for viral DNA. It's the passage site for viral DNA. And it's, it's unusual because I've told you so far that icosahedral symmetry gives you a, a completely symmetrical virion. But here we have a nice icosahedral particle, but at one side, in only one of these five-fold axes, there's this portal for entry and exit of viral DNA. So it shows you that you can break rules sometimes in order to have specified functions, in this case, letting the DNA get in and get out. The tailed bacteriophages are examples of all of the concepts that we've talked about so far. These are amazingly complicated structures. You can see there is an icosahedral head. And again, it has icos it's built with icosahedral symmetry, just like we have talked about for, for all of the other viruses. It is attached to um, a tail or a neck, uh, which has components of helical symmetry. So the taking of protein subunits and wrapping them around a helical spiral is used to build parts of the, uh, the neck. So it's really a complicated rod of sorts. And then we have a base plate, which uh, is, is involved in attachment to the host cell. So these components are all attached during assembly, but you can see that they use two of the main symmetry structures that we've talked about here. And finally, these are the Mimi viruses I wanted to show you because they are amazing. In fact, not too long ago, the structure of Mimi virus was solved by cryo uh, electron microscopy. And it is amazing because remember, these are 750 nanometer particles. The um, triangulation number is 1,179. So we started out by talking about T equals 1 particles, remember. That's just one facet per triangular face. You squeeze in 1,179 facets. These are huge particles. And you can see they have obvious icosahedral symmetry. The, um, the DNA genome is here in the center. It's in white. So 1.2 million base pairs of DNA is put in here. But what's really unusual here, you can see, this is sort of just like the portal in the herpes virus particle. On one side of these particles, there's this star-shaped structure that showed up in the cryo-EM. You can see it's at the top here. It's not at any of the other five-fold axes. So you can easily point out the five-fold axes here, here, and here. And at one five-fold axis, there's a star. And we don't know what this means, but by analogy with uh, the herpes, viruses, we suspect that this is a way for the virus genome to get out. Maybe this opens up um, during entry in, into the cell. So these are amazing structures. And I say here they're challenging structural biologists because the computational power you need to do these are really remarkable. Now, other things are in virus particles other than um, the structural components that I've told you. I just want to go over a few of these to, today. There are, of course, a number of enzymes, and we've talked about a few of these before. Here is the particle of a retrovirus. This happens to be HIV-1. It's an envelope particle. Within this particle, there is the reverse transcriptase in, right here. And that's the enzyme, of course, that copies the RNA genome into DNA. There's also a protease, an enzyme that cleaves proteins. This has a role in the maturation of these particles. You'll, we'll talk more about that later. And then an integrase. So this is the enzyme that puts a, the DNA copy of this virus into your host cell DNA. So three distinct enzymes in the capsid of uh, retroviruses. Uh, there are also other enzymes and other virus particles, poly-A polymerases. Some virions have the capping enzyme that puts that five prime cap at the end of messenger RNAs. That's in the virion itself. Some of them have topoisomerases for unwinding 
uh, double-stranded DNAs, uh, activators of transcription, uh, proteins that degrade mRNA, proteins required for infection, like the proteins in the tegument of the, the herpes viruses. And even some viruses we have now discovered package messenger RNAs in the virus particle. So a lot more than uh, just structural components. There can also be cellular components. Histones are packaged by some viruses. These, of course, are made by the host cell, tRNAs, uh, lipids of various sorts, and many, many others. Let me give you two examples of a host component that's in a virus particle that has a known function. So this is the structure of poliovirus. <clears throat> Remember, it's an icosahedron without an envelope. When the structure of the virus was solved, the, the people who did the work saw this white molecule here in one of the capsid subunits. So the viral proteins are in blue, yellow, and red. And they saw this white molecule, and they, they eventually figured out that it was a lipid. It happens to be a specific lipid called sphingosine. And it was fitting right into, the, into a groove in the middle of one of these viral particles. So here is one capsid protein, or one structural subunit. And five of these would make up one five-fold axis of symmetry here. It turns out that this uh, lipid actually makes the virus particle very stable. And when these viruses attach to receptors, as we'll see next time, this lipid comes out. And it gives the virus particle some, some ability to conformationally flex and eventually open up so that the RNA can get out of it. So this lipid is a switch. It's an uncoding switch. And that's, that's one of the reasons why the particle is metastable. Now, it turns out that many years ago, some antiviral drugs were discovered that inhibit these viruses. And their mechanism of action is that they fit into this pocket where the lipid is, and they displace the lipid. They fit in so tightly that they never leave. So when the virus binds a receptor, normally the lipid would come out. These drugs, these antiviral drugs, fit in extremely tightly, and they lock the virus in a conformation so it can't release its RNA. And here on the lower left is the structure of this particle with the lipid. I could turn this light off for just a moment so you can see this. So here's the virus particle x-ray structure. And you see each of these yellow molecules. That is this antiviral compound fitting in the pocket where the lipid would normally be. So there are 60 copies per virion. That's what would be predicted by icosahedral symmetry. So this is a very interesting pocket. It happens to lie just below where the receptor binds the virus particle. So here's the little pocket here. The drugs fit in there very tightly. They make extensive interactions with the neighboring side chains, and they get locked in there. So even though this antiviral was never of any clinical use, it led to a better understanding of how uh, the viruses uncoat. And one more example of a, a cellular component. So that was a lipid derived from the cell, which is incorporated in the virion and has a function during entry. Here's one more example of um, an, another kind of component that's incorporated into a virus particle that's not structural but has an important role. So this is influenza virus. Remember, this is an envelope virus uh, with a segmented RNA genome. It has spikes in its envelope. The main ones are the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, and we will talk about those much more later. But in addition, there is a very minor component in the envelope called the M2 ion channel. So this was originally discovered many years ago as a minor component of the particle. And no one really knew what it meant until someone expressed it and found that it allows protons. It pumps protons, actually, into the interior of the virus particle. And here's a model of this ion channel. This is the lipid membrane of the virus shown here, and this M2 protein forms an ion channel. It's the smallest known ion channel. These are very short polypeptides. And this has an important role during entry of the virus. It pumps protons into the interior so that eventually the virion can release its RNA. We will talk about that more next time. So two examples of other than structural components in virions that have functions uh, during uncoding.